This conference will now be recorded. Let me share my presentation. Um, did you can see my presentation, uh, Jack? Yes, looks right. great. Thank you. Um, so I'll collapse this. All right. Uh, I cannot see anyone right now. So um, my name is Simon Kurver. Um, I was born and raised in the Netherlands, and uh, I did research on Fabry disease uh, in the Amsterdam UMC. Um, and before I start talking about the research I did uh, from 2016 till 2020, uh, I actually also want to thank uh, the Fabry International uh, Network um, for being included as the first Fabry findings issue and the first Fabry findings webinar. So that's also an honor for me. Um, and I really think that's, uh, that translating scientific, uh, scientific knowledge to lay language is one of the most overlooked parts of uh, doing scientific research. Um, also for me as one of the researchers, I often find how hard it is to get the knowledge that we learn uh, and um, all the Fabry patients participating in research. And it's really hard to get it back to the patients as well. So we, of course, use the knowledge in clinical practice. Um, but uh, I uh, saw such a strong community, at least in the Netherlands, of Fabry patients wanting to participate in research. And I think to um, to keep this going, because I think it's really important to do more research in this field. Uh, I also uh, think it's important to get some feedback about why you are participating in this type of research and what we learned from this. So it was a strong uh, driver for me to uh, to uh, be included in this in this webinar. Um, well, uh, I wanted to address the questions, but uh, Jack already uh, did that. So I will, if you have any questions, type them in the uh, chat function and I will address them at the end. Um, and please, uh, if I go too fast or, or uh, if something is not clear, please address this throughout the presentation so I can uh, adjust, uh, for example, the, the speed in which I talk or something. Um, and it might seem that I'm looking away from you, but this is my ASUS computer and it has the webcam down here. So I'm actually looking at my slide deck, but uh, it's not that I'm looking away uh, from the screen. Uh, so without further ado, I'll start. Um, let's see. Well, this is me um, presenting at the Fabry uh, FSign uh, meeting, a yearly meeting of the Fabry patient uh, group in the Netherlands. Uh, as I said, I was born and raised in the Netherlands and I worked uh, in the Amsterdam UMC uh, together with uh, Carla Hollock and Miriam Langeveld. Um, and I did my PhD thesis work uh, over there. And here on the right, you can see uh, the end result for Brie in the Brain was called. And after that, I uh, was thinking, what should I do now? And now I'm an elderly care physician uh, in training. And I work mostly in nursing homes, so unfortunately I left uh, the metabolic disease uh, group, uh, and now I'm uh, back in the uh, yeah <laughs> back studying and working in nursing homes. And uh, so this is the uh, study or the research group. Uh, of course, I did didn't do the, all this work on my own, um, and I especially want to thank Carla and Miriam for all the support I got throughout these years. Um, before I start explaining uh, my work on cognition in Fabry disease, uh, I think it's important to understand what cognition actually is. Um, because it's quite, a, I think, a difficult concept to grasp if you haven't heard of it. If you look up definitions on the internet, um, you will find some definitions like the use of conscious mental processes. Uh, but it's still quite abstract. So I oftentimes try to explain what cognition is uh, according to different cognitive subdomains. So for example, um, the uh, cognition, um, uh, a part of cognition is the memory function. So short-term memory or long-term memory. Um, language is also a cognitive sub subdomain. So being able uh, to 
speak coherent language uh, sentences and to understand uh, written or spoken language is also a cognitive domain. And another cognitive subdomain is, for example, processing speed. So the speech, speed in which you process new information. And together, all these subdomains form uh, cognition. I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about Fabry disease itself, the disease, because I think uh, the people that are listening here to this presentation uh, oftentimes have some uh, prior knowledge about Fabry disease. You all know probably it's an inherited metabolic X-linked disease affecting different organ systems, such as the kidney, the heart, the brain, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal tract, and uh, the peripheral nervous system, for example. So then on to the question, why would we study cognition in Fabry disease? Well, I want to illustrate this uh, by a hypothetical patient uh, here on the left, um, shaking a doctor's hand. So it's probably pre-COVID. Um, and well, uh, this is a patient coming for his yearly checkup uh, in clinical practice uh, in the outpatient clinic. And beforehand, he had uh, checkups of, uh, of his blood to check his kidney function. He had an MRI of the heart and an MRI of the brain. And the doctor is actually quite satisfied. Everything is stable. There are some white metal lesions, but other than that, uh, well, no big, uh, no big changes compared to the previous year. So the patient is not that happy in this case because he says, well, doctor, my mood hasn't been so good. I feel depressed and I have the feeling I have been forgetting uh, a lot of words and I can remember where I left my keys. Um, is this related to having these white metal lesions or uh, is this related to Fabry disease at all? And a few years ago, I wouldn't have been able to answer this question. And I think it's quite an, uh, an often mentioned complaint um, and I think we should have. Uh, I think we should learn a bit more about this, and that's how we set out to do our studies. And um, one of the things you want to know in a case like this is, for example, uh, are these common problems? Is this uh, does this happen in a lot of patients with Fabry disease? And if so, um, are they easier easy to measure? Can we quantify these problems? And if so, uh, and if they are common, and if they have an impact, for example, on quality of life, should we routinely assess this in clinical practice in the outpatient clinic? And should we do this in all patients or just in some patients that have a higher risk of problems? And for example, can we use these outcomes, uh, for example, as cognition in drug studies in randomized controlled trials? Uh, so that those are all uh, questions that we addressed in, in the research in the past years. Um, if I speak about Fabry disease, I always uh, introduce uh, three important concepts, especially in relation to prognosis. So um, uh, one of these, and this will not surprise you, is age. So uh, as it is an inherited metabolic disease, um, disease severity generally increases with increasing age. Uh, another important factor is sex. So both males and females can be affected. We know that uh, historically uh, it was said that females couldn't be affected since it was an X-linked disease, but uh, we definitely know better now. Um, generally, if you take all uh, males and all females, then males generally do have a bit more uh, uh, disease severity. And uh, patients can also phenotypically be classified uh, as a, having a classical or a non-classical phenotype or an early and a late onset phenotype, which is sort of the same, but, uh, just a different name. And generally patients with a classical phenotype have uh, earlier and uh, more severe disease presentation compared to the non-classical phenotype. So if you combine these factors, age, sex, and phenotype, you can get sort of a graph like this. On the horizontal axis, you see the age. On the ver uh, vertical axis, you see disease severity. 
And for example, women with a non-classical phenotype can have uh, organ involvement, but generally are the least severely affected. And men with non-classical disease and women with classical disease can have quite similar disease presentation, but women with classical disease can also be almost as severely affected or as severely affected as men with classical disease, who generally are the most severely affected. So, also for uh, my study on cognition, uh, Jack already mentioned them uh, quite nicely, but uh, I'll uh, go further into the most, three most important concepts of this study. Uh, one is subjective cognitive complaints, one is uh, objective cognitive impairment, and one is depressive symptoms. And I will explain these terms more thoroughly on the next three slides. So subject of complaints, and I actually, <laughs> I use the Fabry findings issue uh, to uh, look at your explanation, and I think you defined it really well. Um, subject of complaints are uh, complaints, uh, in this case, on uh, in cognition identified by uh, the patient and reported to the doctor. So for example, um, the Fabry brain fork has been mentioned in literature. Um, it has gotten a lot more attention now with long COVID in which also a, long, a lot of patients uh, mentioned the brain fog, so the inability to concentrate, uh, difficulty remembering. Um, so these are subjective complaints that a patient could mention. On the other hand, we try to measure uh, objective cognitive impairment and there, that's impairment that has been measured using a test. So here I gave two examples of, of tests. So there is here on the right is a memory test. Um, and I actually used this test uh, in the research. Um, and uh, this is a list of 15 words in English with a Dutch translation next to it. And patients would hear these 15 words five times and each time uh, they had to uh, remember as much words uh, as they could and then uh, they could sort of practice five times and then after 10, 10 to 15 minutes uh, without hearing these 15 words again they would have to remember how many words they could still remember and this is sort of a short-term long-term memory test another test uh, i used uh, in the uh, in the research was uh, the trail making test you can see here in the middle um, and this is a test that uh, also tests for example processing speed and it asked you to, uh, um, to use a pencil and to draw a line from uh, one to two, two to three, three to four, etc., as fast as possible. And in the second part of this test, uh, they would make it a little bit harder for you uh, and you would have to alternate between numbers and letters. So you would have to go start at one, go to A, go from A to two, two to B, B to three, uh, three to C, etc. So that's uh, sort of a test uh, where you can, uh, for example, test uh, your processing speed. And lastly, uh, we looked at depressive symptoms, and this was done using a screening questionnaire. Uh, in this uh, study, it was the SSD. And in a study, uh, it doesn't sound very nice, I think, but it's uh, I used the term depressive symptoms and not depression or major depressive disorder and I think this is an important distinction because this questionnaire was not designed to, um, to diagnose for example major depressive disorder or depression um, but it can show, show you whether patients experience depressive symptoms. And uh, lastly, we're of course interested in the relations between these concepts. So the, does uh, having uh, cognitive impairment also mean you have a higher chance of being having depressive symptoms, et cetera. So onto the main study. In total, I uh, included 81 patients that were willing to participate. They were all Dutch. Um, the average age was about 45 years old. Uh, about two thirds of them were females and about three quarters of them uh, had a classical disease phenotype. 
and I tested them twice. So I tested them at baseline and after one year um, to see if anything changed over time. Well, on to the results. Um, we looked at objective impairment and uh, that's what we found with the tests. And we found that nine, uh, one out of nine patients had mild cognitive impairment and four out of, uh, uh, so sorry, four out of 81, so one of, out of 20 patients had severe cognitive impairment that actually also showed impair, uh, impairment in their quality of life and had effect, affected their daily lives. Um, the patients with mild cognitive impairment uh, oftentimes did not really experience these problems in, in daily life. And we found that having objective impairment uh, was mostly in men with classical disease uh, and mostly in patients that had a history of stroke. Um, and I will tell you a bit more about that later on in the, uh, in the presentation. And we found no major changes after one year. So if we looked at all individual patients, patients we found no changes in uh, uh, objective cognitive impairment. And also if we looked at the subgroup, so only for example, the patients that already had impairment, or if we looked at only men with classical disease or only patients with a history of stroke, we found no changes in, uh, in their cognitive functioning over a year. Um, depressive symptoms were uh, present in quite a lot of patients. So two out of five at the baseline measurement, so 40%. And uh, the depressive symptoms were evenly spread over the sexes and phenotypes. So it was as common in men with classical disease as in women with non-classical disease, for example. And what we found, which probably doesn't surprise you either, is that there was a clear relation to pain. So patients that experienced more depressive symptoms also experienced more pain. And we found a clear relation to coping. And coping is sort of, uh, can be defined as how you deal with difficult situations in your life. And for example, you have uh, people who are more positive and problem solving. Well, we found that patients that had more positivity and problem solving also experience less depressive symptoms. On the other hand, patients that were more avoidant uh, experienced more depressive symptoms. This is sort of the only and most difficult graph of this presentation, so I'll try to walk you through it. It's uh, one of the uh, graphs, uh, figures out of uh, one of my studies, and it says something about depressive symptoms uh, at baseline and follow-up. And here on the vertical axis, you see the severity of depressive symptoms as measured using the questionnaire. And at the end of the questionnaire, you would get the score. And here you see a dotted, dotted line and all patients above this dotted line could be defined as having uh, depressive symptoms. Um, here, uh, the line on the left uh, is the baseline measurements with all the individual patients uh, as uh, circles or squares. And the one on the right is the follow-up measurement with all patients, again, with uh, circles or squares. And in between, there are all these lines and these lines connect the scores of uh, individual patients. And you see that some of these lines are smaller than the others. And the thicker lines uh, are the ones that show major change over a year. So what we found is that here between these blue lines, there are six patients that showed quite a big decrease in depressive symptoms over a year. Well, there was one patient that had quite a major increase in depressive symptoms over a year. Well, this study was not designed to find why uh, these changes are there. We also, we tried to look whether we could find some patterns. And what we saw was uh, that patients that had the less depressive symptoms after one year also experienced less pain, for example. And patients that experienced uh, more uh, depressive symptoms after one year, uh, for example, showed more avoidant behavior and less positivity and problem solving. Um, so these are correlations, it's not a causal study. So you can also imagine that if you 
are less uh, have less less depressive symptoms. Um, you have less focus on pain, for example. Uh, however, I, I think there are quite interesting uh, um, connections to see. And it also sounds logical, uh, these connections. Um, and then lastly, uh, the subjective complaints were actually very common. So two thir thirds of all patients experienced these subjective complaints, uh, such as the brain fog of the, or the me uh, memory problems. Um, and they were also evenly spread over the sexes and phenotypes. And if we looked at the relations between these concepts, we actually were quite surprised, especially by this relation here on the left. Uh, we found that um, patients that had more subjective complaints did not necessarily have more cognitive impairment on the tests that we did. Similarly, there was uh, no real relation between having more depressive symptoms and uh, scoring lower on these cognitive uh, tests. On the other hand, there was a clear relation between having depressive symptoms and having more subjective complaints. Now I'll explain a bit more on the next slide. So to summarize this part of the study, severe cognitive impairment is rare and it does not progress rapidly, at least not over a year in Fabry patients. Depressive symptoms are common, but can change over a year. So in some people, uh, depressive symptoms decrease, in others it can increase. This can be just the natural course, or maybe, uh, for example, treating pain better might influence this, uh, these depressive symptoms. And we found a real uh, clear relation between subjective complaints and depressive symptoms. So that sort of means that what the patient reports is not always the same as what we find using tests on, uh, at least on the cognitive domain, which doesn't mean that what the patient reports isn't real. Uh, but there are some theories in the general population is this, this relation is also quite strong actually between subjective complaints and depressive symptoms. And one of the theories is that uh, there might be an overfocus on negative stimuli. So for example, uh, patients that experience normal, for, normal forgetfulness, which is uh, something that just happens when you age, uh, can be seen as abnormal by someone who has an overfocus on negative stimu stimuli. So what does this all mean in clinical practice? Um, well, for me as a Fabry doctor, uh, when I found this out, if a patient mentioned uh, having uh, these subjective cognitive complaints, I would still uh, sometimes refer them to a neuropsychologist, which is someone who tests cognition. Um, but I would also uh, see if these patients would be in what I would define as risk groups for cognitive impairment, such as being a man, uh, older man with classical disease, or uh, having had a stroke in history. Um, and it would also uh, send a message to the neuropsychologist to not forget to screen for depressive symptoms, because it might also be a possibility that the subjective complaints, as mentioned by this patient, uh, will be more likely uh, related to depressive symptoms than uh, cognitive impairment that we can find using these neuropsychological tests. And another thing uh, that uh, I discussed with uh, the research team is, uh, should we screen all patients uh, with Fabry disease for depressive symptoms because they are so common in all sexes and phenotypes? Um, and I think that might be something worth at least uh, trying for a study or trying in clinical practice and see if we can refer patients that have a lot of depressive symptoms to a psychologist. And I added specialized psychologists because uh, one of the things uh, I did a lot of these neuropsychological tests uh, in patients' uh, own homes. And oftentimes uh, before we started, uh, I would get a cup of coffee and we'd discuss uh, yeah, a bit about their lives and about Fabry disease and they oftentimes mentioned that they already had troubles with their GP with their general practitioner because Fabry disease is so rare 
that a lot of uh, general practitioners barely know the name uh, even, and uh, let alone uh, know what complaints are related to Febri disease and uh, which complaints aren't. And I think this uh, goes, uh, the same goes for psychologists. Uh, I think a general psychologist doesn't know a whole lot about inherited metabolic diseases and the problems that they pose on individual patients. So uh, I think uh, it might be better to, uh, that patients with Febreze disease might be better off at specialized psychologists. Um, and one of the things that I think should be improved and this is one of the things that might improve it is patient education um, as um, there is some information on the internet about Febreze disease but oftentimes it's very scientific it's hard to grasp um, and I think it can be improved and that also improves um, well uh, uh, the view of individual patients about uh, maybe the view of individual patients about their future and I also think that counseling might be uh, yeah something uh, that should be added uh, to the um, outpatient cl uh, clinic visits of Fabri patients uh, just to see what kind of problems do you encounter as a patient with Fabri disease. Um, so I will take a quick sip of, the, of my water and in the next 10, 20 seconds, um, would you think any of this would benefit you? Um, after this sip of water, I will continue with the second part of my presentation, uh, next 10 minutes or something. So the last part of this uh, presentation will be on cognition and the brain as we did not find any relation between uh, for example the subjective uh, complaints and cognitive functioning or the depressive symptoms and cognitive functioning we also looked at um, uh, the uh, brain involvement on MRI such as white matter lesions and strokes and if we could find a relation between cognitive functioning and one of these uh, uh, features. Um, well, first on white metal lesions and stroke in Fabry disease. Uh, I have two uh, MRI slides here. Uh, here you see a patient on the, the left uh, picture of the two uh, with uh, quite a lot of white metal lesions. Those are the white dots here and the confluent white metal lesions here next to the uh, brain ventricles. Um, and here on the right, you can see a, a patient with uh, stroke uh, here at the white arrow. And you can see the confluent white metal lesions as well here. And um, I did also did uh, a few studies on white metal lesions and, and uh, in cerebral infarctions in Fabry disease. And what we found is that although they are also present in the general population, uh, they are more common in Fabry disease and they occur earlier. And again, mostly in men with classical disease, but we can find them in all uh, in uh, all subgroups defined by uh, or divided by sex and phenotype. And what we see is that they occur from an earlier age. So white metal lesions, for example, are, are also quite common in the aging population, but mostly from 40 years and upwards, and a big increase from 70 years and, and older. Um, and in Fabry disease, this might be 10, 20, 30 years earlier in some patients. Um, and in the uh, general population, uh, having severe white metal lesions has been related to a faster cognitive decline. Well, to make this short, um, we found no relation between uh, having white metal lesions and cognitive impairment in patients with Fabry disease, also no relation to the severity of white metal lesions, but we did find, find a relation between having had stroke uh, on MRI um, and cognitive impairment in, in patients in for, with Fabry disease. So we thought about that 
why uh, would you find this in the general population but not in Fabry disease? Well, one of the major problems is probably the size of the group. If you do a study like this in the general population, you would include two, three hundred, maybe a thousand patients. And well, that's just downright impossible in most Fabry studies. Uh, so the size of the group is probably a problem. On the other hand, there are also some other theories. Um, one of the theories is that white metal lesions, um, whether or not they, uh, they cause impairment, um, is partly related to the location of the damage. Uh, here I have a sort of a schematic view of some brain area. So you have the yellow area, the red area, oh, sorry, the red area and the green area, and they are all interlinked. And you see that there are some crossroads. And these crossroads, for example, if you get a white metal lesions or a small stroke here, well, that probably results in dysfunction uh, um, in uh, multiple, uh, multiple crossroads or multiple hubs. Um, and if you, for example, get a white metal lesion here or a small infarction, then there might be less impairment. So that might sort of explain uh, why uh, different patients uh, sort of have different complaints uh, while they both have white metal lesions. So maybe the location is one of the uh, things that we should be looking at. And there's also another theory uh, that individual patients uh, have uh, different uh, resilience to, uh, of the brain to damage. It's called the brain or the cognitive reserve theory. And uh, the theory behind this is that, uh, for example, um, what they found is that uh, in the general population, uh, people with a higher education compared to people with a lower education, uh, people with a lower education have a higher risk of having cognitive decline with white metal lesions. Same goes for having a lot of social contacts. So if you have a lot of social contacts um, in the general population, uh, generally you have a, a lower chance of getting co cognitive decline with white metal lesions. So there might also be an individual difference there. Well, to round this uh, presentation up, um, I want to talk a bit about prevention. Is it able to, are, are we able to prevent white metal lesions and stroke in Fabry disease? And yeah, again, uh, unfortunately, most of this is unknown. What we do know is that ERT seems to be ineffective in preventing white metal lesions and stroke. Uh, there has been some conflicting results, uh, but generally uh, you, despite receiving enzyme replacement therapy, uh, patients still get new white metal lesions and oftentimes still have strokes, unfortunately. So uh, this doesn't seem to be uh, the best treatment. And there are a lot of new treatments coming and that's a very good thing. And there are a lot of randomized controlled trials right now. And for uh, my PhD thesis, I looked at all the uh, RCT protocols. They have to publish these protocols on the internet before they start the studies. And a lot of these studies lack uh, MRIs of the brain. So um, this is sort of also a call to action for uh, the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Um, if you look at a new drug in, uh, if you look at a new drug in Fabry disease, um, maybe uh, uh, also include MRIs of the brain. Uh, because otherwise we will never know if this new treatment will also uh, benefit patients on uh, uh, in one of their most important organs, namely the brain. Um, in the general population, uh, treating high blood pressure and using anticoagulants in patients that had, have had stroke uh, decreases, uh, significantly decreases the risk of new white metal lesions or strokes. So despite this being not known in Fabry disease, I still think it's important to uh, um, treat high blood pressure if anticoagulants in patients that have, have had stroke, etc. cetera. Um, and um, maybe you also have some influence on uh, your own uh, cognitive reserve. So I think this is good for everyone, but also for patients with Fabry disease. Um, remain physically active, 
um, try to remain, uh, uh, keep a lot of social uh, contacts going and try to keep you mentally stimulated by, for example, listening to a presentation like this. So, uh, as a question to round this off, um, are you able to carry out physical activity? Uh, because I can easily say like, okay, this is good for everyone, but of course I know uh, Fabry disease has been related to, for example, left ventricular hypertrophy, being really tired. So is this something that you're able to do or not? I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on my study and on this question. Um, so that was it for me. And I really uh, want to thank uh, the Sphinx group, which is the research group in the AMC, uh, of course, FSIN, um, and uh, the Fabry International Network, and of course, everyone that had the attention right now and listened to me talk for 40 minutes. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for your presentation. That uh, is, is certainly interesting. and. It is a common question in the patient community about, um, you know, cognitive and and the complaints of forgetfulness and and these types of things. So uh, we're glad to see that this is being looked into. Um, let's see some comments here. Uh, brilliant lecture. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I will screenshot this. <laughs> and there you go. Um, also, if anybody has a uh, question, you can unmute your microphone and ask that at this point if you would like or type it into the chat function. I see Erica uh, uh, had a question about uh, is there something we can do as patients to train our brain? Uh, but I sort of answered that on my last slide already, but I think that, well, there are, it's still a lot of theory and of course we do not know if this also works in Fabry disease, but remaining active uh, mentally, physically, uh, I think that's one of the most important things anyone can do. So also in Fabry disease. Also interesting in the age of COVID, what are your thoughts of social media? uh connections versus face to face well um generally i think uh, face to face is always better if it's possible um i do think e-health is uh, something uh, we should use a bit more um i uh, at least what i uh, noticed in my clinical practice is that we try to see patients uh, through Zoom or, or Teams or anything like that. Um, and I find that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. If it's like a follow-up uh, um, outpatient clinic visit, uh, then I think it could work. Uh, but if someone is uh, sick, well, uh, I have to see a patient. Um, if you are questioning about uh, whether you can maintain maintain friendships uh, through Teams or Zoom, I think that's a possibility. I, I did during the COVID for myself, I did like board games with, with my parents uh, through uh, Teams and Zoom and uh, we played cards and uh, well, it was quite a fun, fun evening. So yeah, but uh, for me, face-to-face uh, -face is, uh, is hard to replace. Yes. Um, one question uh, has come in. Uh, do you maybe know of any specialized psychologists um, that uh, would be good for Fabry patients? Um, well, no. To to say it shortly, I I, uh, I did the research with with one neuropsychologist in the AMC. Um, he has quite some knowledge about Fabry disease, but internationally, uh, I actually uh, haven't seen a lot of it. Uh, there is some research, uh, I think, from uh, a group in Iceland, uh, where a psychologist was the leader of, of the research, Sigmund Dottir, I guess, was her name. Um, 
but uh, no, I don't know uh, someone who's fully trained uh, and knows a lot about Fabry disease internationally, sorry. Yeah, one of the uh, impacts of having a rare condition, um, even though Fabry among the, the rare diseases is not nearly as rare as many others. That's true, yeah. Um, I got a private message, I, wouldn't, I won't say a name, but um, the question is, is, should every patient be screened uh, for white metal lesions? Um, I think it's important to do a, an MRI of the brain at least once, especially before you start treatment, just to have like uh, know where you stand before you start the treatment. Um, because uh, I do think that enzyme replacement therapy is not definitely not the holy grail for preventing uh, white metal lesions. Um, I do not think you have to have an MRI of the brain every year. Uh, I think it depends on uh, what we can do about white metal lesions and up until now not so much. But for example, if I would do an MRI and I would see a new uh, small infarction, then I would see if someone has, for example, uh, heart rhythm disorders or uh, start uh, uh, anticoagulants so i think uh, um, depending on uh, your age your your sex and your phenotype i would uh, depending on that i would uh, define your scan frequency but at least once during your uh, treatment period okay um one one question i have is kind of has to do with the crystal ball if this study was bigger um, you had uh, had stated that there weren't um, any, uh, I guess, statistically significant connections between the, the outcomes of your study other than uh, depression and white matter lesion connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, were there any other areas in there that stuck out a little bit but never reached that level of significance? Um let's see uh actually not really um and is still also in the general population in much larger studies than mine uh the relation for example between depressive symptoms and cognitive impairment remains quite controversial uh similarly between the subjective complaints and cognitive impairment uh, they do find uh, this relation between depressive symptoms and subjective complaints, but not necessarily between the subjective complaint and the cognitive impairment. So uh, the only thing that sort of almost reached statistical significance was the white metal lesions one, uh, which in my study I didn't find, but I think that's also sort of a, a sample size problem. Right. Yeah, more more patients to study, the greater the power of the results. Yeah, very yeah. true. That's always uh, always the the question and the problem. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any additional questions that they would like to ask? One other uh, question is. Did you um, look at pain in your study? Uh, sure. Uh, we looked at pain using the brief pain inventory, which is a, a quite commonly used uh, pain uh, assessment uh, questionnaire in, in Fabry studies, but also outside of Fabry studies. So yeah, we looked at, uh, at pain. Uh, we didn't look at neuropathic pain only. So we looked at pain in, in general. And we didn't divide neuropathic pain and general pain uh, in two different areas because I think there are the neuropathic pain is quite a problem, especially in classical patients. Uh, but pain in general is a problem in Fabry disease. Um, so yeah, uh, we looked at it and we found these relations with depressive symptoms. So more pain was related to more depressive symptoms. Um, so yeah, the treatment of pain should be one of the major, uh, I think, one of the major subjects of every outpatient clinic visit. 
to find out if a patient has pain, can we do something about it? Uh, should we uh, start other treatments? So yeah. Yeah, I know it's come up before that there's a connection between depression and increased levels of pain mm -hmm. associated with that. So uh, certainly that is a large complaint in the Fabry community, uh, pain, GI, yeah. uh, fatigue, and so forth. Um, so hopefully treatment experts will be looking at treating depression as well all as a way to potentially help decrease pain. Yeah, yeah. There's one uh, group I know of, and I think it's uh, uh, from the United States. Uh, it's the group with Ali, uh, and um, they did a study in telephone-based counseling of patients with Fabry disease, um, and they found that uh, because, especially also in the United States, the, it's really difficult if you live seven hours away from the nearest center that treats patients with Fabry disease. You cannot just drive by uh, uh, just to go for counseling for one hour. So they did a telephone-based uh, uh, study and they found a decrease in, in depressive symptoms in patients that routinely had telephone-based uh, counseling. So uh, yeah, I think that, that also might be feasible in other countries. The Netherlands is quite small, so uh, if you drive from anywhere to, the, to Amsterdam, it's like three hours at most, so still quite a long way, but uh, not as far as in other countries. Yeah, the size of the country does make a big difference, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I see another question here by Madeline. Um, would practicing enhancing cognitive functions by things you suggested earlier, such as exercise, social interaction, uh, could this perhaps also help patients by managing easing the depressive symptoms? Very good question, and I can only say yes, very probably. This will, this will also, social interaction, exercise, uh, it will probably decrease depressive symptoms if you do this routinely, yeah. And I got another private question. Um, where do depressive symptoms from, come from? Are, uh, are they related to uh, white metal lesions? Well, that's also a question I addressed in one of my studies, but didn't mention here. Uh, but also no relation found between white metal lesions and depressive symptoms. Uh, what I think is part of the problem is pain, which we mentioned before. Uh, I also think it's really difficult uh, to live with uh, a progressive disease that sort of part by part uh, takes uh, some of your physical abilities, of your maybe your cognitive abilities away step by step, and you have to adjust every time. And that's where I think the coping part comes into play. So uh, how you deal with uh, situations, um, and everyone has different coping skills in his life. Um, and you have sort of a, a tool bag of to coping skills, and uh, in difficult times, you often reach into this tool bag and just see, uh, well, how, how are we going to deal with this? Um, and I think uh, differences between patients and how they react to different situations might also explain why some patients have uh, quite a lot of depressive symptoms and others have not. Okay. Any additional questions? <laughs> I see another one popping up. Are there any, any areas of research that you believe need to have focus would be beneficial to the Fabri community that researchers should start to focus on? Well, um, one of the things I, I want to repeat is the use of MRIs of the brain uh, or other ways to visualize uh, brain involvement in Fabry disease in randomized controlled trials. I mean, that's not a whole new area of research, but I think that can be stated enough how important that is, uh, just to be able to communicate to patients whether this new treatment also does something for, for the brain. Um, and I think, uh, well, we saw uh, in, in the graph I showed that some patients uh, had uh, 
uh, more depressive symptoms after one year and the others uh, d had decreased depressive symptoms, how can we make, uh, how can we improve these symptoms for patients? I think that should be a main focus uh, for research, but I also think it's quite difficult because it's so multifaceted. There are so many uh, factors that, that might uh, influence how you, what your mood is. Okay, there's another question that you're going to have to read. I can't read that one. <laughs> I, I have to use Google Translate one second, sorry, because my I think it's Spanish, but uh, my Spanish is uh, non-existent. Oh Let's yeah, see. this is also, it's a really good question actually. Um, the question is, um, I think freely translated, how much should you inform a patient? When does it stop to be informative and uh, when does it start to be a burden? I think that's sort of freely question, uh, translated uh, the question. Um, I don't know, uh, I think uh, what I did in the beginning when I started in the February uh, 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 community and I also did the outpatient clinic as a doctor um, when we found new white matter one new white metal issue for example I would uh, communicate always communicate this but sometimes pe people the patients got really anxious by hearing this while later on I learned well, this could also be part of just regular aging, the aging process. And one new white metal lesion is generally nothing to worry about. So I think there should be a careful consideration. Uh, I think as a patient, you deserve to know almost everything uh, we find. Um, but uh, I think we as doctors should really consider how we uh, give you this information so how to translate from what we found find and how we how we give this information to the individual patient also depending on how they reacted for example previously how much they want to know there's also the right to not know so you can also say well i don't really want to know um so i yeah it's a thin line i think Okay. Yes. <laughs> and a thank you for that uh, answer. Um, okay, we are at the um, end of the hour now. If there are no more questions at this point, I guess we would uh, we'd like to thank everybody for participating in the. Uh, a call today, uh, especially you, um, uh, Dr. Corva, for you know sharing all of this information, but that you worked so hard to do. Uh, we would like to mention that uh, to date we've we've put together five Fabry findings documents, and that those are available to be downloaded on the Fin website, so you can access uh, the, the document from today's meeting and the other four that have been uh, produced. And this is a continuing program that we will be uh, working on, They're usually producing one or two of these a year. Um, and, you know, feel free to uh, check in on those in the future. We're happy to make them available. Um, so I guess that wraps it up at this point. Um, so thank you everybody. And, uh, I know it's, you know, morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are, uh, fantastic to be able to do these internationally. And we, uh, hope to see you at future, uh, events. So thank you very much and everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.